it's my pleasure to welcome Christian Russell to the stage. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to our presentation. Uh, today, we'll talk about a couple of uh, Android full chains we discovered in the wild in 2021 uh, by monitoring surveillance vendors. Uh, this is us. Uh, on your left-hand side, you have Xingyu and Richard. Uh, they work in the Android malware research team, uh, where they work on protecting Android against malware and exploits. And on your right-hand side, you have me, Christian. I work in Google's uh, threat analysis group. I'll talk a bit uh, more about what we do uh, in a couple of slides. So uh, the main part of this presentation uh, is a deep dive into an exploit uh, we found as part of a full chain. Uh, and Xingyu will guide us through this. Um, but before that, I'll give you some background on what tagged us and some examples of these uh, full chains. And after that, uh, Richard will go through some post-exploitation techniques, uh, an exploit we found in the Play Store, uh, and a bit about uh, defending Android before we uh, wrap up with a conclusion. All right, so a Google's threat analysis group, or TAG for short. Um, our goal is to uh, protect Google and our users. And one way that we're doing this is that we're routinely hunting for zero days exploited in the wild. And as you can see on your right-hand side, um, back in 2019, we reported seven zero days found in the wild, uh, five in 2020, 10 in 2021. So that was a pretty good year for us. Uh, and so far in 2022, we reported three zero days that we found in the wild. And to discover these zero days, um, what we're doing is that, or one thing we're doing, is that we're tracking more than 30 different commercial surveillance vendors. So any company that provides um, exploits or implants or other offensive services to its customers. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned, there's, like, we're tracking more than 30. So uh, like we often see just a handful of companies mentioned in the media, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. And this is a very thriving industry with a lot of different uh, companies involved. And one interesting thing that we've seen is that some of these groups are actually sharing or selling exploits between each other. So there was one case, uh, we had a Chrome Intense Logic flaw uh, back in, I think it was 2021, that we saw several groups using the same exploit. So there's also some uh, form of cooperation going on here. All right, and next up, I'll talk about two Android full chains that we discovered in 2021. Uh, so these are uh, two full chains from two different surveillance vendors. And the first one, um, this was discovered by us in October 2021, uh, and it was served to an up-to-date Android device at the time. Uh, and they were exploiting two vulnerabilities. Uh, one of them was a zero day in Chrome to get execution in Chrome's uh, renderer process, which is heavily sandboxed. And from there, they need to escape the sandbox. And they were exploiting an ePAL reference counting uh, vulnerability in the Linux kernel. And what's interesting about this vulnerability is that it was actually quickly fixed in the upstream kernel. So they um, introduced the patch, like, or the bug with one patch, and then it was fixed, like, I think it was a week later, so pretty quickly. But unfortunately, in Android, only the first patch was picked up, so it left Android vulnerable for about a year, I think. And unfortunately, it's not the first time this has happened. This was also the case for another vulnerability known as Bad Binder which has been yeah, uh, documented a lot publicly. And this was also quickly fixed in the upstream kernel, but took a while to reach Android. Yeah. Um, so one thing that was interesting with this um, full chain uh, in the sandbox escape part, so when they were exploiting this EPOL reference counting vulnerability, they had a pretty interesting exploitation technique that I just wanted to mention because, yeah, I thought it was cool, and I don't think I've ever seen this documented before, so, yeah. So this vulnerability uh, gives an attacker the ability to free a file structure in the Linux kernel uh, while you still have a reference to it from user space as a file descriptor. So you have a pretty classic use after free scenario. Um, and the goal of this exploitation technique, which is just a part of the exploit, it's not like the full exploit, but um, the way that the surveillance vendor chose to exploit the vulnerability, uh, is to get uh, write access to code. And what they're doing here is that they're getting write access to libc, 
Uh, and these changes, when they're writing to libc, will be mirrored into every process on the system. So effectively, this gives you, uh, by exploiting this, uh, you get code execution in every process that uses libc, which is everything. And the steps, uh, the first step is you map libc, which is your target, using mmap. And then you create some file descriptor that you can trigger this vulnerability on. And um, yeah, so I've, uh, in the original code, I mean, there was a huge bug trigger, but I've replaced this with fput, which is the kernel API for freeing file structures. So just to kind of distill it into one slide so it's easier to see. But yeah, so the next step is like you trigger the bug. So now you have a file descriptor that points to a freed file in the kernel. And you quickly replace it by creating a memfd, which will occupy the last freed file structure. And then you map this as readable and writable. And now uh, we want to free this yet again. So since we replaced this previous file structure by creating another file, both of these file uh, descriptors in user space actually points to the same file structure in the kernel. So by closing this twice, we can free the uh, file structure again. And the reason why I have to do it twice is because uh, the Linux kernel has two uh, references to this uh, file, one by creating the memfd and one by doing the mmap. So we free it and yet again we replace it. So now this um, memfd shared memory mapping, it has a reference to the previous file, which you know should be like a shared mem file. But now it's actually libc again. And this is like the juicy part of the exploit technique. What they're doing is looping through every uh, page in libc. So you have this loop looping through every single page and you touch the start of a page. This makes sure that the kernel will load uh, the pages into memory from disk. Um, but the interesting part is when you do this for the readable and writable mapping, the Linux kernel, like the page full handler, will look up the file that's associated with this memory mapping which now is actually libc. And since we just faulted in all the pages, the kernel is happy, and we get libc pages into our readable and writable memory mapping, which we can then overwrite, and this will be reflected in every process. And this particular surveillance vendor used this to inject a shell code into certain system calls that would then load an implant if it was running in the correct process. Yeah. That was the first full chain. So the second one, this is directly related to the exploit that Xing Yu and Richard will talk about. Um, and this surveillance vendor was using quite a, it was a bit different strategy. So instead of using zero days against Chrome, they were actually targeting a Chrome-based browser that was lagging behind Chrome in uh, patches. So they could use um, end days against uh, these browsers uh, as it was a zero day, basically. And depending on the um, version of the browser, they have three different bugs that they would bundle uh, with their exploit. Uh, and for the sandbox escape part, to escape from Chrome, uh, in some cases they were using the bad binder vulnerability that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but in other cases, they were actually using a zero day. And uh, you'll hear more about this bug very soon. But first, let me take you through the kind of timeline. How does it look like uh, for a user that's targeted by this? So the first thing that happens is the user receives a one-time link, and they click it. And when they click it, they're redirected to an exploit server. Uh, and the job of this exploit server is to fingerprint the device and serve the correct exploit, depending on browser versions, OS version, and so on. And in both of uh, these cases for the, uh, for the surveillance vendors, uh, they were targeting Chrome. So they have some sort of Chrome exploit that gets code execution in Chrome's render process. And from there, at least at the time of uh, when we discovered this vulnerability, I'm not sure if it's the same anymore, uh, but they were abusing Chrome's uh, WebAssembly code mappings because they used to be uh, readable, writable, executable. So they put some shell code, an L floater, yeah, and their exploit in there, and by Jumping to this elf loader, they load a local privilege escalation exploit. And with that, I'll hand it over to Xingyu. You can go. Thank you, Christian. So uh, 
We're going to do a deep dive to the zero day we captured, and it's also fixed in the last November. It's the CV 2021-0920. So it's the most, probably the most complicated Android as kernel exploit last year, and it could also be one of the most convoluted exploit in, across the Linux kernel history. In terms of its uh, root cause analysis and exploitation techniques, so basically we captured two major versions of exploits. So the, the exploit version A targeted at recent devi uh, early devices, and exploit B targeted at recent devices. So everything starting at a very simple kind of feature is that users can send file descriptor to other process by something called SCM, the Scholar Rights Datagram, by send message syscall. So let's say I am a socket file descriptor A, and I send a cell to a file descriptor B. So what happens in kernel is that first of all, kernel allocate structure called uh, SKM scout buff or socket buffer or AKA as SKB. I, I pan the uh, socket buffer to the receiver queue. And as you can see, there's one field in the socket buffer points to another newly allocated structure called SCM FP underscore list. And it contains an arrays of file pointers that point to the file in the flight. So from a receiver point of view, it received the message, so the socket buffer is removed from the receiver queue and get free, and kernel will install another file descriptor, C, in terms of the file A. So as you can see, the file A now has two reference counts. Okay, so however, let's consider the following scenario. Like I am the file descriptor A, I send a cell to B, and B send a cell to A. And then what happens in the user space is that user space cross A and B. So there's no way for the kernel to destruct file A and B because they still have a reference count. But there's no way for the user space program to call cross again because file descriptors are already removed from kernel descriptor table. So that's why we need a garbage collector in the Linux kernel. So for example, every time you, you call cross this call, it may trigger garbage collection system. And the way to identify potential garbage is to implement something called in-flight count. So what does in-flight count means is pretty simple, is that you know, if there's a file in the flight, then we just increment the reference count, uh, in-flight count. So as you can see, the A's in-flight count is one because A is in the flight. So similarly, B is, B's in-flight count is also one. So as you can see, the reference count here equals to uh, the in-flight count. So it could be a good sign of potential garbage but it's not always the case. If we consider this cycle, like A send itself to B, B send itself to alpha, alpha send itself to B, and B send to A. So if you use a space program, close A and B, what happens here is that the ref A's reference count equals to the in-flight count, and B's in-flight count uh, equals to the reference count. So A and B are considered as potential garbage, but they are not actual garbage because we can get the file descriptor B from file descriptor alpha, and we can get file descriptor A from the file descriptor B. So from a garbage collector point of view, is that first of all, A and B are considered as potential garbage. So A and B are put into a global list called GC underscore candidates. And then what kernel does is to scan in flight for the GC candidate. So let's say the kernel scans uh, A first, so it will check A's receiver queue, okay? So A's receiver queue is B, and because B is also in the GC candidates, what kernel what does is to decrement the B's in-flight count. So B's in-flight count is decremented from two to one, and similarly, A's in-flight count is also decremented to zero. However, as a result, because B's in-flight count is still above zero, so B is not considered as a garbage. What kernel will do is to recursively re restore in-flight count. So B's in-flight count will be restored to two, and A's in-flight count will be restored from zero to one, and no one is considered as garbage. So however, if you consider the, the aforementioned unbreakable cycle, uh, A and B are considered as potential garbage, so they are put into the GC candidates, and scan in-flight process will lead to the following result that A and B's in-flight count are both zero. So all of them are considered as garbage. So the final step for the kernel is to purge this garbage by remove and free the socket buffer and then destroy file A and B. So we also have two ways to call receive message. So if we call receive message, it's called without message pick flag. First of all, it will synchronize with GC, which means that kernel will install a new file descriptor. 
ACMA before the GC finish. So what happens in the kernel is that the receiver will remove and free the socket buffers and install another uh, file descriptor. However, if we call receive message with message pick flag, uh, it doesn't synchronize with GC. It means that we can have one thread calls receive message with message pick flag while there's another thread doing the GC in the meantime. And also, from receiver point of view, uh, it will not remove the uh, socket buffer, so and, and kernel will still install another file description, so you can see and uh, the A's uh, reference count get elevated. So, okay, so now we really want to introduce the vulnerability scenario. So like I said, the, co the issue here is that the um, me receive message with message peak flag doesn't synchronize with GC. So there will be one file, uh, the reference count get elevated, However, you know, uh, this kind of vulnerability is difficult to trigger because you know, most of the time you heard about it is like, hey, the file reference can't get decremented by accident. So how to, do this, how to get a user free by elevate a file, file reference count? However, it's very complicated and uh, unfortunately we are not going to go through the details here, but we will illustrate the call idea. Um, so, you know, the call idea here that receive message six call doesn't synchronize with, uh, with message peak flag, doesn't synchronize with GC, so it will lead to a very, very uh, complex, inconsistent GC state, and very subtle risk condition here uh, will lead to a result in a user free in the socket buffer. So, uh, you know, we have to create three main threads. One thread does GC, and two, uh, two tags um, calls receive message with own result message peak flag. And through a very convoluted code, code trace, uh, one of the receiver will receive a user-free socket buffer object. So the patch here is actually uh, pretty simple. You know, it's just called spin log and spin log in two lines to make sure like uh, the message peak still call will install an, a file descriptor before GC completes. And interestingly, the kernel bug was found in 2016, and you can see you can check this uh, email thread uh, because it's a public Linux kernel email thread. Uh, unfortunately, the patch was not accepted. So that means any back that bad actors see the uh, Linux kernel email thread may come up with an exploit against the Linux and Android users. Okay, so now let's take a look at how the exploit A does. So A is for the uh, old devices. So first of all, you know, there will be a lot of threat in living and the way to win the risk condition with high chance is to generate as much garbage as possible and it's also a good sign for detection. And in reality, there will be really a lot of threats including each other. Some threats for history, some threats for fixing the kernel structure for forward buttons, and there will be also another, a lot of threats to impact uh, schedulers. And through very, very cold cool traces, there will be a very small chance that you will have a user-free object and also get a history. So that's why the X-ray tries 150 times for getting a spree socket buffer object. And also, spree on the socket buffer object is not, e is not easy because socket buffer object is allocated from our separate cache. So that means the conventional history technique doesn't work, but there is something called cross-cache impact, is that you know, if we can free all the socket, socket buffer object in the same slab page, and free the, so the page may have the chance to be returned to the page allocator that might, might be used by other cache that could be impacted by the normal conventional history technique. But the chance is very small. And now, assume we can spray the SKB and we can control the SKB data. What happens here in the kernel is that if we call the receive message Cisco, kernel will copy um, address from SKB data back to user space. So now the question here is that um, I have no information disclosure what address I should read. So for the x sample A, it's very interesting because it reads on a fixed kernel address and it reads the page size data, calculated MD5 hash value, compare with a hash table with 512 values, uh, so you can calculate the kernel base offset. So why does the exploit read, uh, read a fixed kernel address? So uh, we believe it's because OEMX invented its ARM64 kernel based randomization before mainstream kernel, and based on the exploit, it only randomized nine based at 4K alignment, so an attacker is still able to access a valid kernel address locally. Um, so, by having a semi arbitrary read, the exploit is able to iterate in the task and find the exact task structures from its one-way chart process and get the address of 
the address they made. So if you run your Android device with kernel kind of version lower than 4.14 or writing the address limit to like minus two, we are lead, uh, that and user, user space program is able to read and write arbitrary kernel address. So to get the arbitrary write primitive, the X3 has some very rare things called kernel stack overflow primitive. It, so the basic idea here is that you know, if user space program uh, initialize something called Unix address and pass it to a kernel, what kernel what does is to cause mem copy to copy the, uh, the name from the Unix address. And as you can see, the address here is from the SKB because we have control of the SKB. So presumably, if we have the control of the SKB SK, then we can craft a stack overflow so if we have stack flow, we can craft uh, a lot of stack variables from the double or triple six underscore mes receive message. So this is a bigger diagram, and this is the affected area of the stack overflow we, if we can control the SKB SK. So the way to do so or bypass privilege access never uh, is that the experts use MF syscall and create a user space a memory with map shell property. And because map shell property is not backed up by the copy on write mechanism, so the first time reading memory will trigger the page fault. So as a result, the kernel will allocate a page, and the expert is able to use its um, semi arbitrary read primitive to find uh, to dump the entire kernel stack and find the pointers or page pointers and use page to verge macro to get the corresponding uh, kernel address. Uh, in other words, uh, this, uh, uh, the expert is able to you know, uh, get the corresponding kernel address, but the, virtual, the user space memory and the kernel space memory maps to the uh, same physical pages. And then you can craft all the fake uh, kernel data structures from the user space memory and effectively trigger the stack overflow. So uh, once you do so and, and trigger stack overflow, here is what actually looks like. So first of all, there's one very critical um, stack variable called message header get corrupted. So every time when a receiver calls receive message, the kernel will be tricked to use the corrupted message header. Uh, and then the kernel believe that, hey, we are using the pipe data structure. So you will look up the fake pipe data structure. So the, the right destination address here is it pointed to the text structure. And the source address now point is SKB data. And it, it just points to it points to a keyword which is filled with minus two. So as a result, if uh, the receiver calls receive message, uh, the, the fake pipe data structure will be utilized. So the address limit will be um, overwritten as minus two. So use space program can call arbitrary read write primitive to do uh, to get root privilege. Okay. So uh, let's talk about exploit sample B. So exploit sample B target at a recent version, so there will be no issues in implementing ASLR. Okay, so you know, uh, anytime when we have a user-free socket buffer, the SKB data will be free to, and if like in the, if if I send a file descriptor to another task, the kernel will allocate a structure called SM on FP list, which contains an array of five pointers that point to the file in the flight. Okay, so when the SKB so when SKB gets user free, we can somehow do the history to spray on the SKB data to the newly allocated SCM FP list. So the strategy, strategy here is that the XP sample spans about 85 descriptors for opening five a device node. And then from the receiver side, it could, it will receive like 80 kernel file address. So you know there will be several file structures occupying an entire slab page. Okay, so if we close these five descriptors and do the heap three by sending socket datagram, that means we can control the, the entire Slack page. And then we can craft the, all kinds of fake pipe data structure here to the, the, the control Slack page. So the next question here is that how to link up with our normal file to this fake pipe data structure? So this is what the unlinked primitive came to rescue. So when a victim tells receive user-free socket, data, socket buffer, um, it may evoke something called SKB unlink, and by spring on the SKB and override the next and previous to some uh, uh, malicious uh, address, then what happens in unlink is that the normal file, especially the private data, uh, get hijacked to the uh, control stack page address, or to be more specific, it's the pipe in node info. So the pipe in node info designate kernel that, hey, we have two um, following pipe buffers for read and write primitive. And the next issue here is that the pipe buffer ops is not initialized, so we cannot use this fake pipe structure now. 
However, initialize the pipe ops is a pipe buffer ops is very easy. Just write one byte to the pipe, so kernel will initialize the op for us. And by reading the socket used to occupy the slab page, we can leak the entire slab page, including the pipe buffer op. So we can effectively bypass the ASR, and we may also do the something called pipe migration to bypass um, privilege access never. So uh, to sum up, we by manipulating the pipe buffer page and pipe buffer offset, we can achieve a kernel arbitrary read and write primitive. And this is one more method to bypass the hardware level of mitigation user access override. And we call it as pipe primitive. And we see um, in the why expert use this trick since 2020. So um, since you have the arbitrary read and write primitive, you can get code execution, you can recover a kernel symbol table address. So for more information, please stay turned on our Project Zero guest blog. Now please welcome Richard for talking about post exploitation techniques. Thank you. Thank you, Xingyu. Right, so post-exploitation. Um, the attackers at this point have got a kernel read-write, so you might think the next step is the normal set is SE Linux to permissive and overwrite the process credentials so you become UID zero. However, in this case, the target devices concerned have a hypervisor providing an additional set layer of protection. The memory containing SE Linux enforcing is read-only. The process credential structures are monitored so you can't edit them. And unprivileged user mode processes aren't allowed to call useful functions such as RKP override creds or power off command. So the attackers need to find other ways to change SE Linux and set their user ID. So for SE Linux, the exploit code finds some important static variables by analyzing instructions in SE Linux related kernel functions. Uh, they find an ADRP instruction, which if you know ARM assembler, it's referencing some data. Find the instruction, you know the address of the data. The exploit code can then extract the SE Linux policy, uh, make some modifications to it, refresh, reload the database, and effectively SE Linux has been made permissive. So what about UID zero? Uh, this is a little bit more complicated. Uh, the real-time kernel protection mechanism trusts its own executable. System bin SMD EXE is executed as a privileged process, so this gives you an initial point of entry uh, for getting the back door running. A second executable, simple perf, is used to get the, the full backdoor running. So how this works, inject a bit of shell code into SMD EXE. Uh, this does then use RKP override creds because it is a uh, trusted privileged process. So that sets itself to root UID zero. The full backdoor has been put into simple perf. So SMD EXE then runs simple perf, at which point we have the entire backdoor running as UID zero and SE Linux is effectively in permissive mode. Right, what do the attackers do with this? Um, to begin with, it's pretty much what you might expect. They upload a lot of information off the device, focusing on social media databases, messages, that kind of thing. Uh, the list here isn't comprehensive. We didn't have space on the slide to fit all the path names on. But you can see social media stuff at the top, Android accounts databases at the bottom, and there's a spelling mistake highlighted in red, which we'll come back to later. After copying various data off the device, the attackers then go through and disable a lot of system security settings. Again, they change more settings than are shown here, but we didn't have space on the slide. So, the device is now at increased risk of other malware because security settings, automatic updates, etc., have been disabled. Uh, a number of third-party antivirus applications are also uninstalled, again, potentially placing the user at greater risk of random other malware. And finally, the backdoor can clean itself up if it's commanded to do so. Now, Christian earlier mentioned CVE 2019-2215, so I'd like to go back to look at a particular instance of that. Uh, 
As a reminder of the timeline, in late September 2019, Maddie Stone from Project Zero identified the vulnerability uh, and TAG confirmed evidence of exploitation in the wild. October 2019, Android patched the vulnerability. Uh, we wrote some detection for exploitation and sent that out to see what we could find. So what did we find? Well, we found an exploit for CV 2019-2215. Uh, slightly more interestingly, it contained references to a couple of Android applications within it, one of which is shown here, Pictivio Viewer Kit. Uh, this was on Play at the time we found it, and interestingly, it had been uploaded to Play in February 2019, some seven months before we uh, knew about the existence of CV 2019-2215. As you can see on the right-hand side of this slide, uh, that's quite a comprehensive list of permissions this image viewer has. You probably don't need all of those in order to render images on your device. Uh, the second application wasn't on play. That was an off-market application masquerading as an app from Google using the Google Drive icon. Pictivio Viewer Kit didn't have very many installs. We saw less than 30 lifetime installs uh, by the time we spotted it. There are a number of similarities between the payloads in 2019 and the payloads in 2021. Uh, the ELF files exported a function which was essentially a self-loader. Uh, call that function, that patches up the ELF file for where in memory it is at that time processes all of the relocations, uh, and resolves all of the imports. What's shown on the slide is something else that we saw. Uh, sometimes the ELF header was overwritten by a fairly simple shim, which calls the self-loading function. This is the 64-bit shim. Uh, there was another very similar one for 32-bit. So you can treat the ELF file like a blob of shell code. Just drop it off in memory, jump into the beginning of that block of memory, and it self-loads so everything is fixed up, no extra hassle. Uh, as in 2021, in 2019, the payloads are injected into various privileged processes. The list of similarities goes on. Uh, security settings disabled, files to copy, applications to uninstall, etc. And we see here the same spelling mistake in the 2019 payloads as in 2021. That config file hasn't actually been in that location for a little while, so maybe the attackers just didn't clean up their standard list of files to copy. Right, uh, what are we doing about this? Well, native payloads, anything written that compiles into ARM or ARM64, uh, you've got to have executable memory to run that in. So if you can see some unexpected executable memory turning up in your process. It might be interesting to have a look in that memory to see what the contents are. Uh, the information shown here is from one of our internal analysis systems running Chrome, where we've uh, given Chrome the CVE 2020-16040 exploit, again, that Christian mentioned earlier. If you look here, uh, we can see an interesting length blob of memory is being made read write execute and then slightly below we can see a system call is returning into this uh, potentially suspicious block of read write execute memory uh, so there's definitely some code in there and happily our analysis system captured this blob of memory and saved it out for us so here's the beginning of that potentially suspicious blob of memory and the first thing that might catch your eye is there's an ELF header at a rather unusual offset. Normally, you'd expect to see the ELF header at the beginning of the page, or as I mentioned earlier, uh, depending on what you're looking at, potentially in this case, overwritten by the shim jumping into the self-loading code. The data before the ELF file here is another shim. This one's potentially slightly more interesting. It copies some data from one location to another location and then it jumps into the self-loading export from the ELF file. So, yeah, this TLDR, this is the exploit payload that Xingyu has just uh, explained in great detail. Uh, so this takes us full circle. Uh, 
Tag found the Chrome remote code execution being used in the wild. Uh, it contained an interesting payload, which turned out to be a zero day. The payloads in 2021 have some very strong similarities to the older payloads. And in both cases, the exploits concerned are relating to patching mismatches, you could call them, between Android and Linux, where perhaps a patch wasn't applied in one, whereas it was applied in the other, or something was missed out. So, CV2021-0920 was a very complicated vulnerability, and it was quite complicated to exploit. Uh, the developers came up with some rather interesting behavioral primitives in order to make everything work. Researching and implementing all of that must have taken them some time, so they're obviously fairly well resourced to be able to do it because it might not have succeeded. Uh, the faster the security industry can find and patch things like that, uh, the better we can protect our users and the more time and money it costs the surveillance industry to maintain their capability against things. So, we need to reduce the time it takes us to detect things, to patch things, and to get the updates out there in order to uh, keep protecting people. The faster response we can do this, the better. Hopefully things like vulnerability reward programs are gonna help with this because it encourages people to submit things to us and they'll get some reward. So, uh, with that, I think that's the end. Thank you very much for watching, everybody.